when it's just you, well, times can be tough. Just a, that was a slanderous term invented by Eric Dirtley. So, so then we have the Willamette Valley Aquarium Society that Ashley is president of. We call that Wubbus. So, <laughs> anyway, uh, all right. So now, anyone else? Any other newcomers? Uh, I plan on joining today as well. Yeah. What's your name? My name is Ryan. Hey, Ryan, Ryan Brown. Yeah. Nice to meet you. Welcome, nice to meet you, Troy. Nice to meet you, Ryan. Yeah. Don't worry, there won't be group hugs afterwards. That's, I'm trying to get away from that. Fair warning, officially, too many Ryans now. Anyone else? Is that guy new with the glasses? No, not so much. Uh, okay, well, let's get into it. Ken Borman, uh, who has traveled all the way from Chatham, Ontario, yes. Canada. And you might have a hard time uh, understanding his thick Canadian accent. Uh, okay. yeah. He flew down here for a, a special trip, and uh, he is uh, originally is from Australia, Brisbane, Australia. And uh, in 2000, he moved to Canada. Am I correct? Yes. So far, that's correct. He's actively involved with Canadian. Association or Canadian Association of Aquarium Clubs, of aquarium clubs C A O A C, which doesn't have a friendly pseudonym that you can go by. Kawak. 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 And he's also the North American uh, representative for the Australian New Guinea Fish Association, UNCFA. And uh, very well uh, experienced in Australian fishes. <coughs> traveled a lot of these localities. Has a lot of knowledge to share about these fishes and very enlightening. So, have I missed anything else? That'll do. Okay, okay. Uh, all right, and so take it away, Ken. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dan. I've only just got back from Australia actually three days ago, no, four days ago now, so I'm still on Australian time. So, I hope I don't forget anything. Today my talk is going to be Australian native fishes for your aquarium other than rainbows and blue eyes. Last night I did a talk on rainbows and blue eyes at Roland's house and it was, it was interesting. It was different for me and such a social gathering. Um, that's a map of Australia 150,000 years ago. You can see why the ichthyofauna of New Guinea and the ichthyofauna of Australia are related. Because it used to be the same thing. Now, so compared to the colder climate uh, continents around the world, we've got a, actually a small number of freshwater fishes. Only four species they, they consider to be primary freshwater fishes. That is, fishes that evolved in freshwater. All the rest are inclusions from marine uh, families. That's actually a Queensland lungfish. A remnant of a much larger group that used to live, um, but I'll talk about them in a minute. That picture there is a picture of some rainbow fish. It's the only picture of rainbow fish you'll see today. And it's only there to make you drool. <coughs> That's a particularly nice form of Trifasciata from the Richard River in Northern Territory. Pretty fish. That gets to about six, seven inches. So. Um, a decent sized fish for your aquariums. So, um, yeah, we've only got about between two and three hundred species of fish, which compared to North America is pretty poor. But we're a, a drying continent. The rivers are few and far between, comparatively, and um, the ichthyofauna. Shows that. 
Now, on all my slides, I've got a little map of Australia with, with the locale that the fish are found in with a star on it. And my pointer isn't working all of a sudden. Okay. So, Queensland lungfish, they get to about 28 inches to 30 inches normally, and they can weigh up to 95 pounds. So, if you catch them on the line, you, you, you can't keep them, you can't eat them, you've got to let them go. Um, because they're critically endangered, they're only from, naturally from two river systems in Queensland, the Mary and the Burnett. Uh, they have been introduced to other systems like the Brisbane River in their native Queensland, uh, but they're still considered extremely rare. That particular one there is, um, is an adult. But they start off in an egg, and that's the egg in the bottom right-hand corner, and for comparison, that's a hydra there on the left, if any of you have been cursed with them, you know how small they are. And a tiny little snail above the egg. At this stage, it just looks like a frog egg to me, with a developing tadpole in it. They're quite substantial, but um, there's not really a yolk or anything in there. And that picture on the left is one hatching after about 18 days. And their normal first foods are tiny little aquatic worms and um, crayfish. <coughs> Again, that's a picture of an adult on the bottom. And they normally eat crayfish, mussels, snails, worms. They don't eat fish as such. They're too slow moving to catch the maxwell. And they're very slow growing. They live for a long time. If you ever get one of them, um, they're extremely expensive. There's not many come out of Australia. The ones that do come out, come out legally with little chips in them. And um, they're, not ex they're not cheap. Just ask Steve later on how much cigarettes we're selling them for. So that's what... Yeah, several thousands. <laughs> so that's, hang on, I've got to translate all my measurements to inches. Um, a contribute to you, Ken, on the BAP forums today, when they asked for the size of the male and female, I put it in metric. <laughs> Thank you. That's an eight inch young. So that's about um, <coughs> seven or eight months old, and it's up to eight inches. So as, as a youngster, they grow, for the first year, they go comparatively quickly, but after that, they slow right down. But at this stage, he's actively seeking um, crustaceans and mollusks in the water. Next up, we'll go to the Australian arowana. I'm sure Steve's had these in stock at some stage. That's a, there's two species in Australia. That's the northern Saratoga, what we call them, uh, Scleropages, Jard and I. And that's the, uh, representing its locale is in the Northern Territory. It's in a very tropical area of Australia. It's a monsoonal area. Very pretty fish. You can see from the upslung mouth, it's a surface feeder, and it will actively eat all your fish. Anything you can put in it that it can fit in its mouth. It has a rather large mouth. There is a record of it being a 59 pound fish. Jeez. So that's a, that's a big fish. It gets as much as three foot. And, uh, but that particular one is six inches long, and it's, it's in the, um, in its locale there. And that's the other one, the southern one, Lycarti. As you can see, that's from the east coast. 
that's, that's roughly where the Great Barrier Reef is. So that'll give you some idea of where it is. This one's not quite as big, but it does get um, quite thick and uh, it's almost as heavy. And those are being captively bred? They're being captively bred by us in Australia. And I don't know about Lycardi, but um, certainly Gard and I are available in North America from time to time. Do they only breed them once a year, though? I, yeah. They're only available. <coughs> yeah. But pretty fish, mm -hmm. and they're legal to have here, unlike the Asian ones. There's a close-up of the um, dentition. You can see from the teeth and the size of the mouth. Anything that can fit in there will go in there. And they're a great culling machine. Ooh, the other, basically, freshwater species, uh, so yeah, freshwater species are archer fish. That particular one is Toxodes tatarus, or seven spot. They get 16 inches, so decent fish. Again, with an upslung mouth. Thank you. You're welcome. If you know about archer fishes, if, if they see an insect on, on a reed above the water line, they can spit droplets of water at them, knock them off the reed and into the water where they gobble them up. I've seen archer fish do this, both in the wild and in aquariums, and I've never seen one miss. They fresh water get their prey. only? Fresh water, brackish? Fresh water. They can tolerate brackish, but fresh water for this one. Some of the Asian ones, I believe, are brackish. As I say, it gets to 16 inches, but um, that particular one's only a little. That's, that's <laughs> about a four inch one. A pretty little fish. Good to have. Uh, they're hard to breed. Very hard to breed. But uh, a friend of mine on a fish farm in Queensland has cracked them and he's letting the information out. Another archer fish from Australia, this time from Western Australia, is that one. Lawrence I. Now, Ichthyologists think that's the most primitive of them and the first of them. They all diverge from that type. It's is the pretty plain. Uh, the mouth isn't as well developed as the previous one. No pattern or anything. It's just a silver fish. <coughs> so anyone who likes Central American <coughs> should really like that one. You love the Again, they're really good marksmen with the spitting of the water. I've never seen one of these miss either. I've only seen them a couple of times, but I've never seen one miss. Um, it is a, it's a really well-developed trait and obviously very effective. Not many people keep this one because of its remote locale, basically, uh, and comparative cost. But uh, it is kept in Australia, and um, hopefully we'll get some over in North America shortly. Next up is one of our catfish. This is a salmon, we call a salmon tail catfish. <coughs> because of the tail, obviously. These fellas get to 18 inches, so they're a decent size. And, <coughs> and that one's from South East Queensland. That's actually from my home city. As, as catfish go, they're pretty ugly, but um, some people keep them. I don't like them personally, but other people do. There's no accounting for taste. This is a particularly smaller specimen. This one only gets to nine inches, total length. So it's much better suited for the smaller aquarium. But basically it looks the same as the other one. Another tiny one for huge range. It goes from the star on the right to the star on the left, so right across the top of the tropical Australia. And uh, again, that's a much smaller one. At only about six inches, uh, seven inches, sorry, that one. But very slender, as you can see. And then we get some of the eel tail catfishes. 
These are cool because they're, they're so different to all the other catfishes around the world, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, this one is from the inland of Australia, as you can huh. see on the map. And in there, it's somewhat of a desert. Still, obviously, rivers there. Also, be no fish. But um, these ones get to 12 inches. I've never seen one that big. The biggest I've ever seen is 9 inches. But uh, apparently, they can grow to 12. Nice little catfish. That's a male and a female there. Male in the front and the female at the back. They are bred in captivity. And they breed just like most other catfish. <coughs> that's just another shot of one. That's a fully grown adult. Are there multiple Neosaurus type species in Australia? Are you going to get the. Yes, there are. Okay. Um, that's, that's the same one, just from a different locale. Um, are those from yeah, there's I, there's six I think. Remember, these are just the ones that are most commonly kept that I've put in this uh, slide chat. Yeah, I think that both the Neosaurus and in this species were just in the Port Mary actually recently. Right. Yeah. Well, this is Tandanus Tandanus, uh, and we call this one the eel tail catfish. This one gets to 36 inches, so that's a big fish. Um, they tell me it's good eating. I've never eaten it. That particular one is 10 inches long. Ugly, as are all catfish, but they all have personalities. And um, they're bottom dwelling, as you would expect from a catfish, and they eat catfish food. Um, mussels, worms, and crustaceans, basically. They're not averse to eating fish either. And this species is also fairly cold tolerant, right? It is fairly cold tolerant. As you can see from that bottom star on the right hand side, it's right down south in Australia and that's very cold. Actually down there, it snows down there. So if it ever got into the waters of Portland, it would do quite well. <laughs> Eating all the salmon. <laughs> This is another Tandanus, a particularly small one. This is from Western Australia, right on the left-hand side there. Um, this one only gets to, to 20 inches, as, a, as opposed to the 36-inch one. Uh, that particular one is five inches long. It's, it's dwarf species. Yep, comparatively. <coughs> Still a big fish. And it eats the same stuff. And these ones we call Australian smelt, Ripopina salmoni. Um, it's got quite a range, as you can see. The two stars on the right hand side represent the north and south limits of its range. The stars on the left just indicate that it's in the Murray Darling River system, which is an inland river system, which is quite extensive. These guys grow to four inches. So they're quite small. They're good for, um, for a, you could keep, say, five or six of these in a 24 gallon, uh, 20 gallon tank. Trouble with these though, they go into transport shock really easily. Every time I used to catch these, I'd kill them transferring them into the bucket from the net. And I could never work out why until an old guy from Ankford told me he put a bit of salt in the water of the bucket that you're putting them into. So I did that and I never lost one after that. Hmm. Now they don't normally occur anywhere where there is salt, but for some reason that helps. They're from quite a, a diverse range of habitats and with that you'd expect them to be different things and they do and that's reflected in their colour. You can actually see their intestines inside. They're so transparent. So you can see what they had for lunch. This is what we call a hardy head. And so it's from the northern parts of Australia in the tropics. Again, 
That's a two inch fish. Somewhat colourful. Um, you can see on the range map there's that one little pocket on the right hand side and then the much larger pocket on the left hand side. That's the acknowledged range of these fish at the moment. But I was talking to Peter Unmack, who is familiar to most of the well, some of the people here, and he thinks that um, there are different species. And after he does some DNA analysis, he will probably rename the one on the right. That's another shot of them. This is the ones from the Northern Territory. Pretty little fish. Say, those ones are two inches. And they do quite well at 22 to 30 degrees anywhere in there. They're fine. They're omnivorous and they do eat algae. Are they relatively easy to spawn in the captivity? Yes, they are. In mops, just like you would a rainbow. I was going to say they do have a superficial resemblance to. Yeah, I was going to say yeah. they look a lot like rainbows. Yeah, with that double dorsal and everything, yeah, I mean, they do, really do look like that. At one stage, they were considered rainbow fish. That makes sense. Until they were split out into a different group, the hardy heads. That's the one from Queensland. You can see how different that one looks to that one. And that's why Peter thinks that they're two different species. And he's probably right. He seems to know what he's talking about. Next up we go to some southern fish, which would do quite well here. These, this group, the Galaxiids, they occur in Australia, New Zealand, and South, the bottom part of South America. As such, they tolerate cold really well. They live under ice most of the time in winter. Um, so they would do quite well here. They're our southern hemisphere equivalent to your trout and, um, and salmon. That one grows to seven inches. It's one of the bigger ones. And as you can see, it somewhat resembles a killie. A very long, cylindrical body. They're great bait fish. The fishermen love them. They just hook through their back and let them go. This is another galaxian, a barred galaxian. This is from a city called Melbourne. It's a huge city and as such it's threatening this fish. It likes to live in Melbourne and so do people. People are winning out unfortunately. This one only gets to six inches. Uh, that particular one's a four inch specimen. Very pretty, but highly endangered. Galaxids, by the way, are egg scatterers. And they will predate on their own eggs, so if you want to breed them, you'd have to breed them like you would a tetra. Or the marbles or something like that. <coughs> There's a couple of others, as you can see, they're quite cylindrical. On the range map, the top, arrow, uh, top star represents the, the top fish and the bottom star represents the bottom fish. So all in the southern areas. Um, the, the top one gets to um, 8 inches and so does the bottom actually. That one actually does live in the mountains, hence the common name Mountain Galaxias. Uh, that one gets to 6 inches. And that's the most cold tolerant of them all. It's just another photo of the same fish, same species. These ones are particularly pretty. The top one there is the one that's on the left hand side in Western Australia. No, I'm wrong, sorry. It's the one on the, the bottom <coughs> one is the one on the left hand side in Western Australia. Western Mud Minnow. That's only a little fella. He gets to about three inches long. But the top one is extremely endangered. It only gets to one and a half inches long. It's illegal to keep these in Australia. All well, the black suits? No, the only the top one. Okay. Although I do know people who have some. As is usual in any country. 
I included this one. This is ex highly illegal to keep because it's critically endangered. Um, it's the most ancient of all the galaxies. It's only from a one river system in Western Australia. It burrows into sand, just leaves, leaves its head exposed, hunting for small copy pods and things like that. And it's got a shoulder girdle, so it can turn its head. Unlike most fishes that have to turn their whole body, or all other fishes that have to turn their whole body to look sideways, this guy can keep its body still and look sideways, like we do. A friend of mine, Heiko Blair, is particularly enamoured of that. He's intrigued by it. And then we have our own glass fish too. Ambassus species, this one's Agassizi eye. It gets to about three inches, that particular one's about two. Um, as you can see, the top and the bottom star indicate that it's on the coastal plains, and the star on the inside means it's on the inland rivers as well. Quite widespread, very easy to catch, and um, popular little fish. But there are others in that genus. Oh, that one's nice. It's a sailfin glass, uh, glass fish from right up north. That gets to about three inches long and quite attractive with that barring on, the, on all the fins and the yellow cast behind the barring. They're schooling fish? They are schooling fish. They probably do best in a group of about at least five. They are harder to sex than something like a rainbow or something like that, but um, the usual things like uh, pointier fins and rounder body on a female, pointier fins on a male, are the usual indicators. That's only a just under two inch fish. It's about an inch and a half fish, that particular one, so quite colourful for something so small. It gets to about three inches too. Very pretty. And then this is our equivalent of North American perch. This is a pygmy perch. It only gets to three and a half inches. So you'd need a lot of them to eat to get a meal. But all these fish are occurring, this fish and its cousins occur in the fresh water of the coal regions too. So they would do well up here if they weren't eaten. Not Extremely colourful, but um, quite popular to be kept. They're quite personable. That's another pygmy perch that's kept quite common, commonly over there. That gets to three inches as well. They're colourful enough in their own right. Just more of the same, basically. This only gets to two and a quarter inches. So it's a pretty small one, but um, nice little fish. Again, that's a two inch one. That's a two and a half one. Two and a half inch one from Western Australia. Very nice. This is probably my favorite of the ones I'm gonna show you today. That's a 12 inch fish. That's the male on the top and the female below. They're running from one river system in New South Wales. As you can see from that star. They normally sift through the bottom for worms and mussels and crustaceans. If that looks like a pike cichlid, I think they're, they're wonderful. So much better than pikes because they're not that vicious. So yet again, a fish that's better than a cichlid. Are they uh, easy to bring captivity? I know of two people who've done it, but most, most don't breed them. Fascinating fish. They're beautiful fish. This is a really good one. This is called, the common name is Mouth Almighty. Now this is a mouth brooder, as you can see from that top left photo. And quite a range down the east coast of Australia, from uh, within the tropics down to uh, a substantial distance. If you look very closely at that main photo though, you'll see something sticking out of that fish's mouth and a huge lump in its abdomen. Well, that's 
his wife. <laughs> That's the tail sticking out of his mouth. And that lump is her head. So they're mouth breeders, huh? They are mouth breeders. <laughs> and if any can f anything can fit in there, it does. I've seen one eat another fish that was about a quarter of an inch short, smaller than itself. So got, they, they do have huge mouths and um, they get to about six inches, so a substantial fish. And if you get one on the line, it fights. So the fishermen love to catch them. Oh, that's pretty nice. That's an empire gudgeon. They've been around in North America for quite a few years. Uh, that's a male in breeding colour. Quite a range of these ones too. Um, they're quite common actually in North America. So common I've got some in my tanks even. That's a female. <laughs> so as you can see, as is usual, the males are much prettier than the females. The males have also got that rounded head, whereas the females are, uh, are more slender. But easy to breed, harder to raise the fry. The fry are, are very small, but um, with a bit of practice you can do it, as long as you know what to feed them. What do you feed them? Green water. There you go. Mm -hmm. Just like rainbows. Uh, I, I'm beginning to see a, uh, that as a recurring theme throughout many of these fish. Yeah. Yeah. They've all got tiny fry, but if you if you're prepared for tiny fry, you can you can breed them successfully. It's another um, gudgeon that's kept down there, Hypsaliotris gallii. Uh, it's called the fire tail gudgeon, and depending on the locale, they can be either orange or red in their fence. That's the male on top, the female below. They get to just over two inches long. So they're not a big fish. <coughs> they're omnivorous as well. That's a fire tail gudgeon just from a different locale. As you can see on that one, the fins are quite yellow compared to the red ones on that one. This is one that is available in a, up here in North America as well. Uh, purple spotted gudgeon, we call them. Magunda dispersa. There's another species called Magunda magunda, which is from the tropics. They're not commonly kept in Australia because uh, this one is so easily procured. I think the ones that are called Magunda magunda up here in North America might be a, actually Magunda dispersa. That's the male on the top and the female below. As you can see, the male is smaller than the female. He has got that rounded head that's common to most gudgeons and the f again the female's more slender head. They do get to six inches, so they're quite a decent sized fish. You don't want to put small fish in with them. They're ambush predators and they're very good at it. Is that male at risk of being eaten by the female? No. They would only eat something the size of a guppy or a, maybe a three month old like lupi. Do people commonly collect them uh, by the, you know, by themselves? Do they go out and collect these? Yeah, they're quite common. I was walking home from work one day and I saw this brilliant flash of blue and red in the water of a creek. I was on a, on a bridge probably 20 feet above the creek. I raced home. I was only a block from home. I went home, got my trap, got a, got a beer and my cigarettes, went back, set the trap. Had a smoke, had a beer, pulled up the trap and I had a pair of these in there. And they were displaying and breeding. That's what caught my eye. They're very colourful when they breed. And they were about six inches long too. They are fully grown, they are magnificent. I, l I let them go. That's the male guarding the eggs. So after the female lays them and the male fertilises them, she just swims off and he looks after him. As you can see, he's quite colourful at this stage. Very pretty fish. 
But, as I said, you do have to look out for the small fishes in the tank with them. I put this in because it's just cool. I would love to have one of these. It's called a bull rout. It's a freshwater stone fish. Every one of those dorsal rays, every one of the anal rays, and every one of the pelvic rays have venom glands on them. Nice. They get to a foot long. They're quite the large. And they love to lurk in the vegetation of the sides of creeks. And that's why you wear shoes when you go fishing in Australia. On the east coast, anyway. Um, How bad is the venom? It's very bad. It won't kill you, but you'll wish you were dead. It's closely related to the stonefish that lives on the Great Barrier Reef, whose poison is stronger. And it has been known to kill um, younger children and older adults. Ken, have you been struck by that fish before? No. <laughs> I always wear shoes. <laughs> but if you had one of them, you'd have to be careful. All around the eye as well, there's, there's tiny little um, spines around the eye. So everywhere on that fish, you don't want to touch, really. Are they related to lionfish? <laughs> Distantly. Yeah, they are. They're both fish. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's closest living relative. It's, it's a stonefish that lives on the Great Barrier Reef. And I think they are distantly related to lionfish. That's familiar to most people here. That's been available in North America for over 100 years. Death goby. It only gets to two and a half inches. That's a male in breeding colour. It naturally occurs in only one spring in a, in a state called South Australia. The spring would be smaller than this room. And it's quite saline. Um, I haven't heard of it being bred in fresh water. If, as far as I know, it's got to be have at least brackish water to breed. What sort of salinity are you talking about with regard to the brackish water? Like you're talking maybe 1.05 specific gravity? Well, we'll do the Australian measurement. About three pinches of salt in a 10 gallon tank. <laughs> Three inches of salt for ten gallons. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you can you can you can taste it, but only just. Are they being sustainably collected? Uh, they don't have to be anymore. They're bred everywhere. They're very easy to breed with that salt in the in the in the water. Um, the male will attract the female over probably to a corner under a sponge filter. They'll breed, she'll lay the eggs, and then he chases her away. If you don't remove the female, her colour, and then he'll look after the eggs and the fry for a while until they start to disperse, and then you've got to get rid of him, or else he'll eat the, the babies too. But that's what they look like when they the males look like when they're breeding, and that's what they look like when they're not breeding. So, it's, um, yeah, it's a brown fish, must appeal to the Central American people. <laughs> I'm sorry, Eric. That looks I can't a lot like a cereal. Right, that's a coal grunter. This is, is available in, a, in North America from time to time. Um, for me, that's the most cichlid looking thing we have. And it's even more vicious than cichlids. Hmm. I've known cichlid keepers have these and they've beaten crap out of these cichlids. Um, they get quite large. How large is large? That one, that particular one's 12 centimeters, so that's, that's only five inches. But they will get 13, 14, 15 inches long. Bigger than an Oscar. People angle for them. Apparently they're good eating. I've never eaten one. But quite attractive. They look good. 
And as I said, they have been available in North America from time to time for quite a while now. A different grunter is a sooty grunter. This is an even bigger one. This gets to 20 inches. That particular one is 8 inches long. Good angling fish, but to me, if, if that had a broken lateral line and the nostrils were right, it would be a cichlid to me. It's available, obviously, you can see in the tropics, in the two stars. So it's, it loves the warm water. Are they hard to breed? They're not hard to breed as long as you can give them enough room. They're somewhat aggressive, kind of specifically as, as well as to other fish. So um, the males would take it out of the females. You'd have to give her hiding spaces. Just like any cichlid or any other larger fish. How warm does the water get? Well, there's always deeper spots, so anywhere between, you know, 78 to 82, probably, yeah. Do they prefer hard or soft water? Where they're from, I would say soft water. I like it. I've never kept them myself, but soft water, from the range, it would be soft water. That one, also soft water. That looks like a pair of tilapia almost. It does. Or a bleaker eye or something. Wow, that's pretty Now, I'm nearly finished, but I had to put this in. This is our spotted scat. So it's really an estuarine fish, a brackish water fish. It grows to 12 inches. However, that's one at three months old. Quite a pretty little fish. It's only three centimeters long, so that's just over an inch. Sierra scatophagus is a real fish. Mm -hmm. I forgot, yeah, I had to say that. <laughs> yeah. So that's at three, three months old. This is the same fish at six months old. Ooh. Completely different. It spots now. And this is him at nine months old. Almost all the And by 12 months old, he's. he's uh, a fully functioning adult, all the colours gone out of him, a lot of the black spots have disappeared, it's basically a silver fish with the occasional black spot and that's it. Oh. But that just intrigued me, that colour change from that to that. And that's why most people in Australia who keep them, do keep them. That's basically it, the other aquarium fish we have in Australia, are all those. <sighs> yeah, three small yeah, they're all those. Unfortunately, there are self-sustaining breeding populations of every one of these fish somewhere in Australia. Oh, poor mosquitoes. And as you can see, there's everything from carp to barbs to loaches, live bearers. Oscars, tigers, sword tails. Heaps of cichlids. There's killids, the flag fish, guamis. Yeah, heaps but, and heaps of cichlids. But the most evil one up there is the mosquito And fish. they haven't been released by the government. Unfortunately, they must have only been released by aquarists. Except for the gambusia. Gambusia, the only one. Uh, uh, sorry, I was referring to the cichlids. Yeah, the, um, the government fish. would be responsible for uh, only the gambusia. Unfortunately, we're responsible for everything else. <coughs> so the key lesson here is, if you have fish and you want to rehome them, do not let them go in the rivers and creeks. Eat right. them. That's correct. Send them to Australia. Of anything. <laughs> <laughs> or else Don't let them go here because you'll introduce, if the fish doesn't live, the disease they may carry yeah. may live on. Yep. And now, all these fish aren't available in every river in Australia, but there are breeding colonies of these fishes in different rivers all around Australia. Hmm. So, uh, and they're affecting native fish. Yeah, and they do predate on the fry of the native fish. And, they, and as Joe said, the chances of them introducing a disease into the wild is, is pretty high too. So, take them to your local fish club or dispose of them humanely, please.
Use your frying pan. And basically, that's it. If you want any more information, thank you. Ken, two things. Do yeah. you want to take questions? Do you want to talk yeah. about cares real quick? That's coming up. Okay. Let's do. Let's All right. not over yet. All right. So, All right, so if you want to know anything more about Australian fishes, including the rainbows and blue eyes, which I talked about last night, um, have a look at ANCFA, the Australian New Guinea Fishes Association. Uh, the website is ANCFA. Dot, is it ANCFA.org.au, I believe. Uh, Google it, you'll find it. <laughs> um, membership's currently $30 Australian per calendar year. That works out to be about $23. US and you get um, four really good emailed newsletters from them for that. They're scientifically produced publications, they're great, high quality, heaps of photos. I didn't.